Today we're going to cover two important topics. Uh, first, the fundamentals of the Hodge-Huxley equation that describe the physics of the action potential. And secondly, the fundamentals of programming in MATLAB, which is one of the most useful and powerful programs used in all of research, especially neuroscience research. So um, this is the main equation, which right off the bat looks intimidating, right? And in some ways, this is actually a lot simpler than you might first think, though. Uh, but in order to understand it, we're going to have to start basic, and then we'll go deeper, and then we'll come back to some basics. So I'm actually going to start off with what seems like a totally unrelated example, but it will illustrate the electrical concept of the Hodgkin-Huxley equations in a more mechanical way that actually, I think, makes more intuitive sense. So even if you haven't used calculus in a long time, I think you'll be really able to enjoy the concepts that are going on here. So... Imagine a mass hanging on the end of a spring. It's a pretty simple setup, and the position of the mass is simply dependent on the sum of two forces, the downward force of gravity and the upward force of the spring, which is given by Hooke's law, that old force equals k times x. x is the vertical position of the spring, so at, at perfect rest with no weight, the position of the spring, we would say, is x equals zero. Um, and it turns out that these same equations can actually show us not only where the mass ends up resting when the mass is placed on the spring, but they can actually show us the movements and the behaviors of the mass if we make any perturbation, so like pulling the mass down and then letting it go bouncing up and down. All we have to do is simply sum the forces together. Uh, so one force is mass times acceleration, uh, pulling down on the spring, and... Uh, remember that acceleration is simply a double derivative of position. So uh, that's indicated by the double dots over the x. Uh, a dot usually means a derivative with respect to time. So a double dots is the double derivative of x with respect to time, or in other words, acceleration. And x, again, is the vertical position. And the other force is, is pulling back up on the mass. It's the upward force of the spring given by uh, uh, k times x where k is uh, the spring constant, and x represent, represents the amount of shift from the zero point. So these forces, they'll always sum to zero uh, unless uh, some additional external force is put on the object. So it, when I put my hand into the system and pull on the mass, that's an external force that I'm applying. But if I'm not messing around with the mass, then the sum of the forces is always equal to zero. It's just equal and opposite reactions. Uh, and so um, I'm trying not to get too complicated, but once I release the mass, I'm not exerting any external force on it. So the mass is just going to oscillate freely up and down. And so you can see here we have some equation where some variable, in this case x, the position, also directly relates in some way to the derivative of itself. And whenever you have that case, it's called a differential equation. So um, whenever x equals some function of the derivative of x, or the double derivative, uh, that is a differential equation. And it turns out that differential equations arise in every single aspect of the universe, from celestial mechanics to electromagnetics to quantum theory and, and a whole variety of other things. And when you solve them, they almost always result in another equation, which usually involves e to the power of something. e is that number, 2.71828, that arises everywhere in nature. And so when a solution is oscillatory, it will actually have e to the power of an imaginary number times the variable, like time. Uh, which is actually mathematically identical to the sum of sines and cosines, if you remember from trigonometry. So the sum of sine and cosine waves can represent basically any uh, oscillatory pattern. And so sine waves can basically represent the solutions of differential equations and explain the exact movements of a, mouse, uh, a mass bouncing on a spring, for example. So when you look at this solution, it will turn out that the spring will want to vibrate at a natural harmonic frequency, omega, 
Um, and that will equal, it just turns out, it equals the square root of the spring constant over the mass. So a really simple solution for uh, the oscillations of a mass on a spring. So pretty cool, but how does this apply to the Hodgkin-Huxley equations? Well, the Hodgkin-Huxley equations are also differential equations that describe the oscillation of voltage across a membrane. So at rest, that voltage is just going to be static, like a mass hanging on a spring. But if we perturb the system in some way, like a shock to the neuron, we can get an oscillation in the membrane, which we call the action potential. Now, this was first done in the 1950s. It was in a giant squid neuron. So some of the constants they used in the equation are different than in a human neuron, but the concepts are still the same. So let's look at where the Hodgkin-Huxley equation comes from. As I talked about in our last lecture on EEG, we can have V equals IR, where current flow is limited by resistance, and we can also have current equals capacitance times the change in voltage with respect to time, which means current flows across a capacitor when there is a change in voltage. Uh, rather than say V equals IR, I can actually instead use the inverse of resistance, which is just called conductance, and so I can write this equation as current I equals voltage V times G. G is conductance. And as a side note, we can actually ignore inductance in neurons, which involves a double derivative. So in neurons, the sum of forces is simply capacitive flow and resistive flow uh, summed together. Now you can already see that this is the sum of forces, just like we saw with the mechanical example, and this already looks like the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. If we label each component, it's simply the sum of all forces, which would normally sum to zero unless we add in some externally applied current from an electrode stimulator, for example. So our ultimate goal is to solve for voltage in terms of time. So we'd like to find voltage on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And you can also see that the resistive forces here are separated into individual ion components, potassium, sodium, and chloride. And that's because these individual ions flow through specific channels, and we want to account for each one. So sodium and potassium in particular have unique voltage-sensitive gates in the membrane that will open and close in response to the membrane voltage. So this complicates things, and it gives us an additional set of differential equations to model. Uh, here we use the letters M, N, and H to represent the, the probability that those gates are open or closed. You can also represent other ions in some specific types of neurons or heart cells. They'll have other ion channels. We're not representing those here. We're just doing a very basic model of a, of a classic neuron. So the letter N represents the potassium gate, while the letter M and H are the sodium gates, where H is actually that weird inactivation gate that's on the inside of membranes. Uh, the probability of the gates being opened is then determined by the forward and backward rate constants alpha and beta, which in turn are influenced by voltage and make up a further set of equations. So you can see, see that these rate constant equations also involve e to the power of voltage meaning that they arose from yet a fourth set of differential equations not shown here. This concept of rate constants and gate states can actually be represented by the old chemistry uh, concept of, of drawing out chemical reactions, where you have a reactant A that goes to some product B, and the rate of change of A can be dependent on the concentration. And so um, you get this situation drawn here where uh, the rate of change of B, for example, it will depend on the amount of A that goes forward to B minus the amount of B that reverses the reaction back to A. And likewise, you can get the, the inverse, where the rate of change of A is dependent on the amount of, uh, of B going to A minus the amount of A reversing and going back to B. So this same concept applies to any state um, so, for example, the state of a gate being open or closed, you could imagine A being an open state and B being a closed state. It turns out that it creates this uh, differential equation where the rate of change of one state to another is dependent not on time but on voltage.
And so I just drew a little uh, example here of, of a basic differential equation showing why we end up with e to the power of something in a differential equation. So if you look at the derivative of alpha um, <clears throat> with respect to voltage, when it equals alpha times some constant, then essentially you can uh, divide by, or just invert the denominator and the other side of the equals equation. So you get d alpha over alpha equals the constant a times dv. If you integrate both sides, it just cancels out dv and, and you're, you're basically left with voltage on one side and you're left with a natural log on the other side. And, and so what you're going to be left with is alpha equals e to the power of the constant a times your voltage. If that was confusing, don't worry about it. That's not the point here. But it just shows why e ends up in so many solutions to differential equations. So what this is saying basically is that the rate constant alpha, in the case of the Hodg Hodgkin-Huxley equations, the rate constant alpha is not actually a constant, but it itself is also dependent on voltage. So what you end up with here is basically uh, every variable influencing every other variable. And so the way you can think of solving this equation is actually just to make equal steps through time. Like let's just say we uh, make one little step every microsecond. Well, we can plot the way that, remember a derivative is just a slope. So with each microsecond step that we take in time, we can estimate the slope um, of each variable and estimate how it would change in time. So we make these little time steps and uh, using numerical methods we can estimate the slope and how each variable changes and how that change in turn will influence all the other variables and then how those variables will come back and influence our original variables. So that's kind of the concept of how we're going to solve this equation. So now you've seen that the Hodgkin-Huxley equations are actually a set of complex differential equations. It's technically four equations with four unknowns, but still no one has yet found an exact solution to these equations, and one probably doesn't exist. Although if you're really interested, you can go study differential equations and maybe you'll discover one, but believe it or not, you are going to solve this equation today using software. So, um, <clears throat> so MATLAB is the software we'll use. It's incredibly good at using these so-called numerical methods to solve differential equations. And this is the same technique that's used when scientists calculate all sorts of things, orbital trajectories through space, future weather patterns, and many other applications in physics and science. So <clears throat> this software doesn't give us an exact solution where you can just plug in your variables and punch out a solution but it uses more complex techniques that uh, you can learn about in a course on differential equations. All right, a couple other things to point out here. Um, in the Hodgkin-Huxley uh, primary equation, you see that G with a line over the top. What that means is uh, maximal conductance assuming all the channels are open. So uh, that's what it means. If And then the K, the subscript K indicates potassium or Na indicates sodium, obviously. Also the VK, the VL, and the VNA, those are values that are based on the equilibrium membrane potential for each ion, which are determined from what the membrane potential would be if the membrane were fully, per fully permeable to only that one specific ion. It's also worth noting here that the Hodgkin-Huxley equation is one of the coolest equations in all of history, and all of physics, because it predicted things that we had no concept of at the time. So... Um, one of the things is we didn't really understand what voltage-gated channels were. We had no concept of, uh, you know, the molecular biology or the atomic structure of these channels, and, and certainly not how a channel could let through a sodium ion uh, or a potassium ion separately, but not, you know, potassium should be bigger than sodium, and yet somehow it can be specific to pa potassium, but not let through a sodium, even though they have the same charge. It, it's sort of baffling. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, we didn't understand, uh, why these, uh, values of M to the third power and H and N to the fourth power, we didn't understand why these were appearing in the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. And it, it turns out that they have a perfect explanation. So 
uh, you know, when, when you flip a coin, the probability of flipping four heads in a row is just, uh, the, the probability of flipping a head to the fourth power, uh, 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5. Well, it's the same thing here. We know that there are four domains in the, uh, four domains that span the membrane in the ion channel. And, it turns out that these have a sort of probabilistic behavior as the voltage increases, where it's the probability of all four domains acting together to actually, in concert, open the channel so that the ion can flow through. So that's actually a really cool, remarkable thing that, that the physics predicted before we understood the biology. It's also incredible that the potassium channel has slightly different properties than the sodium channel. If the potassium channel didn't have a slight delay in opening, or if it didn't open at a slightly higher voltage than the sodium channel, then we would not even get an action potential at all. So uh, these these subtle little properties uh, really make the action potential possible and, and thereby make all of intelligent thought possible. And it's all based on these sort of quantum level behaviors of these charged domains in these uh, beautifully constructed structural proteins in the membrane. So there's at least uh, seven things that I think this equation predicts, but we won't go into them all in detail. But it is just fascinating, the brilliance of, of this equation, which is part of why this work won the Nobel Prize. So in your MATLAB program today, the variable that we're most interested in solving is the membrane voltage, Vm. Uh, but instead, in the instructions, I call it y for brevity. So that's the variable you'll solve, solve for, y with respect to t. Um, <clears throat> so the probability that the sodium channel is open is labeled as, as the variable m, and the probability for a potassium channel is n, and the probability for a sodium inactivation channel is h. So in all, we have, like I said, four variables solved with four equations, and each equation um, has the variable related to the derivative of itself. So this is a set of four ordinary differential equations, which are much simpler to solve, actually, than partial differential equations, where you have multiple variables within the same equation. Um, but because of this, something cool that we can do in mathematics is combine all the variables into a single variable in vector form, and consolidate our four ordinary differential equations into a single ordinary differential equation. Or in other words, uh, we're gonna make y represent all four unknown variables, similar to how a location variable could have three parts, like x, y, z coordinates, which can change independently with time, but which also can relate to each other. So I just wrote this program for fun late one night while studying and a long time ago, and I'm sure it could be written much better, but it's the best I can do for now. And I think it's um, useful to go through it, and, and it, it is a little bit tedious, but it actually shows you the life of a programmer. And actually, just by doing it, you will get used to the commands and the and the language and um, see what it's like maybe just for for a few minutes at least to uh, write a program in MATLAB. Since this is an online uh, lecture series format, I'm not able to help you guys if something goes wrong with your program. So um, let me just warn you of a couple mistakes that I've seen students commonly make. One is uh, make sure you save your script files in the same folder location so that uh, MATLAB knows where they are. And also make sure um, that you're using proper capitalization or lowercase letters because that matters. If, if you name a file name with a capital letter, but then in the other script you call on that file name, but you write it in lowercase, it's not going to know what file you're talking about. So everything matters. Capitalization matters. Typically every space, every punctuation, everything, just assume everything matters. Now sometimes it doesn't matter, but just for the sake of not making too many mistakes, realize that everything matters. I've written the instructions in courier font, which purposely makes each letter have the exact same spacing. So hopefully there's not too much com confusion in the instructions for how to write the code for this. Um, and also realize that uh, 
you don't have to actually type anything after the percentage symbol. The percent symbol is kind of just a note to the programmer, a note to yourself. So um, in order to save time, you don't have to write all the explanations that are after a percent symbol. So go ahead, follow the instructions and create two script files and enter in the code that I've given you and then click run, which is the green arrow at the top of the editor screen. And hopefully, congratulations, you've solved your first Hodgkin-Huxley equations. It should show you two different uh, graphs or plots. Uh, one will be directly overlaid on the other, but you can spread them out there. And you can use these plots to answer the questions that I've given you. And if you need to, you can actually uh, select the tools and go down and click data cursor and you can find exact values on the graph that way. So I'll ask you things like, what's the threshold membrane voltage where an action potential ends up firing? What's the firing rate of the neuron? Um, I ask you to double the extracellular potassium concentration to uh, simulate the condition of hyperkalemia and then run the simulation again and try to figure out why does why doesn't the maximal membrane voltage change with the altered potassium but why does the resting membrane potential change and also try to explain why the firing rate changes in hyperkalemia all these effects are not exactly intuitive so when trying to answer these questions think about how uh, a more depolarized resting membrane potential will actually affect gates like the probability of the H inactivation gate being closed. Um, so the normal hyperpolarization caused by potassium outflow from the cell at rest is actually reduced due to a decreased gradient caused by the high extracellular potassium and that can effectively raise the resting membrane potential across the membrane and secondly, uh, this slow depolarization will tend to make the probability higher that sodium channels are open, which lets more sodium ions into the cell, causing a f further uh, slight depolarization effect. And all these depolarization effects can cause partial closure or inactivation of the H gate of the sodium channel, which slows the ability of action potentials to occur. So despite being more depolarized, Think about how the neuron uh, is actually, because of the, the probability of gates being closed, the neuron actually fly, fires at a slower rate. Then the final question actually gets really complicated because uh, it's going to ask you about integrating in multiple physiologic aspects. So uh, I just take the example of long distance runners. Think of uh, the end of a marathon, for example, or an ultra marathon. So uh, on one hand, you get dehydration, which uh, your, your volume depleted. So your kidneys are using sodium to osmotically resorb water back into the bloodstream. And to do this, the kidney resorbs sodium at the expense of potassium uh, in an exchange mechanism. So on one hand, you can get hypokalemic with low potassium in your extracellular fluid. But on the other hand, during continued strenuous exercise, the repeated firing of muscle cells and the breakdown of stressed cells can cause excessive amounts of potassium release into a contracted volume of extracellular fluid, which then results in hyperkalemia. So uh, these are two completely opposite effects that can happen. And if you actually measure uh, people at the end of a marathon, take their potassium level, uh, in a large percentage, it's low, and in a large percentage, it's high. Uh, it's really a unique phenomenon. So um, I ask you, thinking of potassium and calcium, what are two opposing results that you could expect on neuromuscular function in this scenario? So uh, on one hand, uh, with either hypo or hyperkalemia, you have an impaired ability to fire action potentials, which in turn impairs the ability to contract the muscle. So um, on one hand, your nerves can't tell your muscles to fire. With hypokalemia, the reasons are a little bit different. In real neurons, there's not a constant injection of current. So the hyperpolarization in hypokalemia uh, of the resting membrane potential makes it harder for neurons to fire. So you would actually also see a slowed firing in hypokalemia just for different reasons and mechanisms than with hyperkalemia. But anyway, now remember with hyperkalemia, for example, we have this increased state of depolarization. 
which uh, in turn causes an increased likelihood that the membrane voltage on neurons and muscle cells is uh, elevated or de more depolarized. And this increases the likelihood that calcium release is excessively occurring in the cell. And that calcium release, uh, either from sarcoplasmic reticulum in muscle or endoplasmic reticulum in neuron, it can then go on to bind troponin and move tropomyosin, and that allows myosin and ATP to contract. So it can actually create these muscle contractions that are independent of what the nerve is telling the muscle to do. So that's why you get these opposing results, a sort of flaccid nerve, but an overactive muscle that's cramping. And... Uh, remember, we also have lots of other reasons for this too. For example, we have calcium dependent calcium channels in the membrane and uh, with hyperkalemia, um, that increased state of depolarization can link to the DHP receptor channels and open them up to cause more calcium release. And also at the end of a marathon, you're just depleted of ATP, um, which is also necessary to pump calcium back out of the intracellular space, back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we have lots of reasons to have excessive calcium in the cell. And uh, in addition, with impaired blood flow and things like that at the end of a race, if you're volume depleted, it has a lower pH, you can get lower acetylcholinesterase activity, which means you have more effect of acetylcholine at the synapse, which causes increased uh, contractions. So there's a lot going on here, and this is really only scratching the surface. If you really want to get complex uh, and dig deep, try figuring out why hypokalemia causes cramping and uh, decreased muscle performance as well. It's pretty interesting, and the mechanisms are, are quite complex and overlapping, and we don't even, believe it or not, even still in this day and age, we don't even fully understand it still, but there's a lot of really interesting data on it. So you can see here that there, there there's all sorts of um, sort of disjointments of the electrolytes and, and signaling going on here. And this is part of why it's so difficult to create an electrolyte rehydration drink that would actually fix cramping in all scenarios. Certainly sometimes you can do it, but you don't always know whether someone is hyper or hypokalemic. And not only that, but it's difficult to fix in the intracellular space as well. So um, this is why conditioning and uh, exercise-induced gene expression changes are so important for athletes. Okay, so I hope that's a fun introduction to computational modeling and uh, Hodgkin-Huxley equations and MATLAB and neuron action potentials and ion balances and everything. So uh, good luck on the assignment. Feel free to email if you have questions. Thanks a lot.